Okay, so this is titled machine, and it's really a question of how how can you actually think uh, um, uh, a grace as a, as a machine, and uh, isn't isn't that, because if you say habit and aut automatism and uh, words like that, um, doesn't that mean it is an actual machine? And uh, so that that will be a huge question today. Um, let me let me just start with a few images here. I refer to those in the book as well, car driving and horse riding. Um, because if you say a, a grace is a machine or there is a grace machine, somehow there's a grace machine, but it, it, it doesn't have a causal mechanism. Uh, how does it actually relate to, to the machines we know and, uh, and, and to technology? And I think to start with Samuel Butler would be interesting because um, I'm not sure if you guys know this book, Erewhon, uh, which is the palindrome. Is it a palindrome? The reverse of nowhere. And it has these beautiful three chapters in there, the, uh, the book of the machines. And uh, it's, a, it's a very influential uh, a section of the book. Uh, uh, Samuel Butler actually deserves a, a lot of attention. Um, this, uh, we quote it from the book Life and Habits, but Erewhon is actually full with these ideas. And um, he describes um, a man using a spade. And he describes the man using a spade as, as something that's prosthetic. So all the ideas in the 20th century of, of, of technology as, as a form of extension of man, to use McLuhan's words, uh, can be directly derived from uh, 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 um, uh, Samuel Butler, uh, Stiegler's ideas, uh, Gregory Bateson we already mentioned, um, there's, uh, of course, uh, Felix Guattari. A lot of thinking of technology as, as prosthetic comes from uh, the book of the machines. And um, he's actually describing them as, um, if I remember correctly, as extracorporeal limbs. So if we're discussing the law of the limbs of Ravison uh, uh, from the 1830s, and we immediately go to 40 years later to Samuel Butler, there must be somehow a connection. Now, what is that connection? Um, especially, you have to ask that question uh, if you say, look, uh, able and enable are, are not smoothly connected in the sense of hand and glove. So there must be somehow uh, a way of saying, okay, um, yes, the body is extended by technology, but does that immediately mean that that technology is then extended into the human body? Because uh, that's that's actually what Gregory Bateson is saying. Gregory Bateson is, is, is using a similar uh, um, uh, a simile. Um, not a man with a spade, but man with the X, and uh, and he's actually saying there's a there's a cybernetic loop. Of course, uh, Gregory Bateson comes from uh, the, the second phase in cybernetics, and um, and he's actually saying, well, there's a loop between uh, from the man uh, from his muscles to the X to the tree, and from the tree to the man, to the eyes, via the eyes. So that, uh, as a looping function. Uh, so there, there's a double prosthetics in his mind. And I think that's where the argument goes wrong. I think that's, um, it should actually be understood. And, and we know that from driving a car, it's, it's true that the, uh, when you drive, uh, you become the car, but the car becomes you or the, the car um, is absorbed by you, but not in the same way. You have to become car-like uh, to actually drive a car. Not, uh, in the same way, you have to be hammer-like to actually hammer a nail in the wall. And that like is a very important term in my mind. So that, yes, there is a prosthetic relation uh, between us and the technology, but there's a mimetic relationship between the technology and us. So the reverse, it's not, it's not symmetrical. There's an asymmetrical loop here between the prosthetic and the mimetic. So yes, you drive the car and the car drives you, but it's, 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 
it's not a symmetrical construction and we'll talk a lot about this um, especially in the in the, when we get to the figure of of uh, of the chiastic and chiasmus um how we should actually understand those the, the two halves of of that argument um let me go to a, a few other figures. Um, one is Paul Suryo, um, L'Esthétique du, uh, du Mouvement, um, from uh, the 1880s, 1889. Um, uh, you can see that um, um, he is actually extremely influenced by uh, 19th century physiology, uh, Claude Bernard, figures like that, uh, the notion of reflexes. Um, and uh, he speaks a lot about grace uh, in, in his book uh, on the aesthetics of movement, clearly, because uh, that's, I mean, that was already the formulation of uh, Friedrich Schiller. Um, but he does go like very extreme in the sense that he, he, uh, he picks up the argument of, uh, of Samuel Butler and saying, well, it is unconscious. It is a movement that is uh, unreflected unreflected so you cannot be conscious of your movement especially if it's it's a movement that is uh, uh, going in a direction of grace but then he says yes this automatism right that's over here the automatism um, actually becomes an issue of the reflexes so um, it's like you know and it's like a, a becoming of a pure body and uh, and without mind so it's it's the mind becomes unconscious but then it sort of uh, descends into a, a, a pure state of uh, of neurology and that uh, it, it gives it an extremely uh, organic explanation of grace that there's uh, okay there's as long as there's no consciousness coming between us and our actions uh, it becomes like a, a, a pure neurological expression Right, so in that sense, it's almost like um, our, our limbs become, uh, our own limbs become the technological extensions of, uh, of Samuel Butler. Of course, that's what Samuel Butler himself also said. Yes, the technology is, uh, is, uh, becomes organic, but the organic itself, our own hands and, and limbs are in that sense machine-like. Now, um, a, a figure that is, uh, 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 similar to Paul Suryo is, uh, is Herbert Spencer. Of course, he's earlier, but he has a very similar uh, um, mechanistic explanation of grace. Um, um, he has a, um, a, a notion of uh, what he calls ease, um, that at a certain moment, um, grace becomes pure ease. And again, uh, what he calls an economy of muscular effort, right? So there's a notion of, uh, of effortlessness of, of grace that we know from uh, um, Felix Raffaison. And then there's the, the, the economy of the muscular effort. So the economy is at its maximum, again, when we, ha when we act habitually. And there's the word, how habitually is uh, um, a, 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 a a connection between the effortlessness and and the muscular effort because we are not because we are not the obstacle between us uh, and our actions now um, uh, like Suryo, uh, herbert spencer gives a lot of examples uh, one is diving um, in water and uh, the other is skating and uh, and for him, these are, and like for Suryo, these are um, like uh, notions of perfection, right? So you do a lot of training, a lot of training, and then you get the most perfect dive, or you get uh, the most perfect figures eight on, on the ice. And uh, I think what that misses is this gap. You know, what, what it really misses is the fact that however we automate, automate ourselves, um, it remains uncertain. It remains, uh, it's never sure, you know, ask any diver, Olympic uh, diving champion, it's, it's never certain that you will get the perfect dive. So you might have a lot of training, but there's still that moment, that gap between you and, and your act. Uh, that makes it a, a moment of grace. And uh, 
I think what uh, I put like a, a, not a skating figure, but what we nowadays call a skating figure on a skateboard. And I didn't put in a, a, a dancing figure from a from a dance competition, but actually a break dancer, because these figures seem to understand better that, um, however contorted or complex uh, or smooth the action is. There's a there's an needs to be an inclusion of uh, of uh, of this cut between us and our actions, and uh, I think that's that's why they started to invent like in the 70s and 80s these forms of uh, of broken broken dance and uh, um, um, forms of skating. Uh, of course, let's keep in mind that these are not done on an Olympic track. Yes, they're done. You can see skateboarders now on an Olympic track that is all smooth. But if you look uh, uh, carefully at how skaters behave in the city, you'll see a lot of curbs. You'll see railings. You see stairs. All these uh, all these elements that are incremental and uh, and, and thresholds uh, and broken. And not at all smooth spaces, and um, I think that's what's so interesting is that they f they find in in these spaces uh, p points, uh, almost like cusps or twists uh, in in movement that doesn't make it fully continuous, and and not a sense of flow or 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 control. And I think that's that's the danger of uh, looking at grace as a, as a form of pure flow. That it becomes a, a a capability or an ability of of the subject. Uh, sure, the subject loses itself, but it's still in uh, by losing itself, it gets full control over over its movements. And uh, I think in that in that sense, you get sort of a dark side of this this word of uh, uh, automatism. So, um, uh, and they're also missing this. Um, if it becomes like a, a purely horizontal uh, um, flow, it misses this notion of Burke of, of posture, how to actually understand how the movement becomes a figure and a, a figure of posture, because we always get this ambiguity of a movement and an object, right? So the movement becoming an object, that's grace, the object becoming movement, that was, we defined that as beauty. And I think in that sense, we, we're getting closer to the notion of play uh, and even sports, uh, which we'll get to later, where we can actually learn a lot of uh, of how a grace machine can be structured. Um, um, I'm I'm showing a few pages of uh, of Huizinga here. Um, his name is actually Huizinga. Uh, I I once mentioned to a French colleague Huizinga, and he said, Ah, Huizinga. Um, so the name housing is actually more more difficult to pronounce than my own name, uh, but he of course he wrote this beautiful book, uh, the autumn of the Middle Ages. But uh, after that, uh, in the th in the thirties, Homo Ludens, which became this the, almost the Bible of uh, of the la ludique uh, of this whole notion of of play in the nineteen fifties and sixties situationism, uh, especially in architecture, people like Constant and. Uh, and so we get this um, a new idea, and, and obviously it comes from Schiller. Um, Schiller described like bees flying in the air as a, as a drive to play, Spieltrieb. Uh, let's let's not forget that uh, the word Spiel in German um, relates to spilling. So there is a, a notion of waste or an excess of energy. So it's not an economy of, of energy. It is actually a, a wasting of, of energy uh, and surplus. And that's how play got connected to uh, the gift and the descriptions of mouse as, as surplus, for instance, with the, the potlatch. Um, now, what's really interesting is that I think this is the second chapter of Homo Ludens, is that um, there's, it's, it's a very etymological uh, uh, um, uh, chapter, and it actually uh, links spill to spilling and waste, um, but it also discusses the word seriousness, um, uh, which is really interesting because the word serious is related to the German schwer, and schwer means heavy. So there we go again, gravity. So how does play relate to? gravity 
is is it like okay we have gravity here and there's play there i mean that's how we always understand it right so we have we're doing our work at daytime and then in the evening we do play right there's leisure or in the weekend right <laughs> The weekend is actually an invention of the of the uh, the 1920s. I'm not sure if you ever watched Downton Abbey. There's this there's this fabulous um, um, dowager played by Maggie Smith, who at a certain point says, "What is a weekend?" Because all the young people are talking about weekends. What are you doing in the weekend? And she says, "What what, what is a weekend?" And that's actually correct. Uh, uh, a, uh, historically correct from the writers that the idea of the weekend is really a, 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 an invention of the 1920s, <clears throat> which is of, of course the decline of of the British aristocracy. Um, that's another point. Um, so, in that sense, we are taught to understand work and play as separate, like what we are taught in architecture, structure and ornament as separate. And here it's a similar, it's like the seriousness or the gravitas, and then there's the grace of play. Uh, but, but Huizinga actually makes a more complex argument. He actually says at the end, you know, for seriousness seeks to exclude play, whereas play can very well include seriousness. So again, we get this, uh, how, is, how does play include uh, gravitas or, 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 or weight or seriousness. Now, Huizinga wrote this in the, in the 1930s. Uh, he, he, the Olympics and football games, and I, I, with football I, I mean um, European football, soccer, um, he probably uh, didn't see the stadiums of Real Madrid or Barcelona, where you can fit 120,000 people, um, which are extremely fanatical. Uh, we know this fanaticism of uh, of hooligans, um, and we we know. <laughs> I'm just uh, like a, a wondering here how how serious play play can be. Um, <clears throat> for them, it, for them, it's life or death. You know, it's 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 not play at all in the sense of uh, going away from the serious. It's actually the most serious thing, right? You're going from game to game, and it's probably the same for poker players. It's probably the same for uh, for video gamers, and it, um, and it's probably the same for athletes, and it's probably. The, the same for movie stars who are also players and theater actors who are players. And so play is actually extremely serious. And we and in reverse, I would say, um, thinking more of Schiller, that the reverse is also true, that you, you cannot be serious or you cannot just do your duty, right, in the sense of, uh, of Schiller by being strenuous. You have to find relaxation in your work uh, to do it to do it uh, well. I mean, maybe that's the word. And I mean, how do we live well? Is the sentence that uh, Grace and Gravity, the book, starts with. But it is true. It's it's uh, there is play in in there needs to be found play in seriousness, and it needs to be found uh, seriousness in 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 play or play in seriousness. So that's a, it's a double relationship, and uh, of course we can say a lot about f fanaticism. I, I'd love to say a lot about it. I'm not sure if I have the time, but um, m maybe it's the way to understand American politics, right? So I don't want to go too far with this, but um, I was wondering about how American politics is is so not political, cannot be understood through a notion of politics. That means an exchanging of ideas, um, um, or truth, for that matter, or ideology. It's it's uh, more and more a, a, a game, uh, more and more a, a battle or a match as well, and uh, it 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 does require a lot of themos, uh, a, 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 a lot of spiritedness, and uh, and uh, and even combat. You know, this sort of the fanaticism. We see uh, in, in politics might be far better understood 
uh, from a non-political point of view and far better in a, in a, in a point of view of, uh, of exchange or grace exchange or, or play. I think that might be an, another discussion, but uh, uh, for sure that must be the case. Now, um, uh, I have two pages here from uh, two different books. Uh, well, it's not a book on the right, it's actually an article by David Foster Wallace on, on Roger Federer. So I'm slowly moving from play to sports, uh, uh, especially on how to learn, to learn how to uh, construct the, the, the grace machine. Uh, on the left, we have a page from um, a, 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 a Dutch author, uh, Henriette Groenewegen, don't try to pronounce it, but she actually discusses serious play um, in the context of Minoan culture. Um, it's a book from the 1950s. Um, she discusses Heisinger's work and, and she moves slowly to, uh, to Minoan culture. And uh, I'm sure you all know Minoan culture had, had an obsession with, uh, with bulls and bull jumping. Uh, by the way, the whole culture was obsessed with jumping. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you know all the frescoes, but the frescoes have uh, jumping monkeys and they have jumping uh, dolphins on, on the walls. And, uh, and uh, the vases are built like the heads of uh, bulls and, uh, and the ceremonies were, uh, were uh, combined with uh, bull jumping competitions probably, so nobody really knows. Now a bull weighs uh, what about two thousand pounds, um, and it's heading toward you to full speed, and you're jumping over it. I, I'm sure you all know, like uh, the the salto mortale, the 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 the, the, the death jump. You you grab the horns of the bull while the bull is like lifting its head, and you're making a salto, a a, a twist in the air, a, a, a rotation in the air to actually then land either on the back of the bull sometimes or behind the bull. So that's a good example of serious play, right? So that is that is life or death. So it's, this is not sports in this, how we understand it. But of course we understand sports in, in, maybe in a much more serious sense, um, but in, not in the language, because we, use the, we, think of the, uh, we think of sports as something you do in that weekend. Uh, but our culture is, is much more serious about about sports. Now, um, I'm, I'm slowly moving to uh, sports, um, um, but for that we need to understand, uh, 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 let's say the the relationship between uh, 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 jumping and uh, and the field. Um, the field as a, is it a smooth space or is it not a smooth space? Um, I think the image on the left shows like a, a very interesting image um, because um, there's there's something happening here. There's a there's lines in the sand, and the lines are drawn in such a way that you have to jump. Right, that's hopscotch, of course. Um, uh, and, you ha and you have to jump uh, in, 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 in different positions. You have to turn, spread your legs, jump forward, jump backward, uh, rotate 180 degrees. So there's a whole game of, of how you play this. But what's really important is the spacing of the lines. And they're spaced in such a way that it's not easy. Right, and that's of course what play is. It's that gap. It's not not just that foot on the on the ground. It's also the other foot that's lifted, and it's the same with dolphins. Uh, we always think that do dolphins are like the happiest creatures uh, uh, ever. I think John Liddy actually called them angels, um, <clears throat> and they play an important role in John Durham Peters' book uh, on elemental media. Um, but if you look carefully. You see a mammal uh, uh, coming from the water to to breathe. So in that sense, it's not in its element, right? The jump is actually a, a, an expression of uh, of of the animal not fitting. And uh, yes, obviously, it's very good and very graceful in its in its jumping, but it is actually creating this gap. So I'm looking not so much at at how that animal links to uh, 
to the feel, to the water, to the smooth water, and not, and not how the leg of the girl actually fits on the sand. But I'm looking at the gap. I'm looking at the gap between the uh, um, the sand and, and the foot, and it's created by the spacing of the of the of the lines. And I'm also thinking of uh, of how uh, how this is so important in poetry. Uh, I'm sure you you know of poetic feet um, and how we create a meter through prosody. Uh, where we articulate space, so it's a rhythm. Um, to talk about the rhythm is is not at all uh, smooth. It's actually a punctuation or articulation. So we are seeing that the smoothness is is being broken in a way that um, there's a non-fitting possible. There's a, actually a, you you need to jump. You need to find the figure of jumping to actually uh, uh, pass through the stages of the of the of the circles <clears throat> now i'm i'm slowly going to um, uh, uh, introduce a term that is different than space i'm going to introduce the word room um, which is uh, for architects um, almost impossible to grasp. Um, of course, we have rooms, uh, but that's not the same thing as, as a room. Um, uh, space is something we, uh, we understand either as a Cartesian set of coordinates or as something more fluid when we go to uh, time space, space time, uh, and where perception plays an important role. But room is something as much uh, happening in time as a window of opportunity as it is uh, something in space, like wiggle room, or the room between, let's say, your body and your jacket, or um, all kinds of different types of room. Now, I'm not going to extend um, on the on the etymology of the word room, but it, it is an important, uh, in, in sports especially, it plays an incredibly important role. And uh, I'm, I'm now going to look at um, how sports um, almost uh, replaces sculpture. I think um, if, you, if you look at the history of grace, um, the history of grace um, using art to actually understand figures and figuration, um, Roland Barthes talks about this, uh, statues, uh, Michel Serre talks about statues, um, but Roland Barthes connects them immediately to athletes and also to orators. Um, but athletes are very interesting because we got a very, we look very carefully at the whole structure of sports. We can an, learn an enormous amount of uh, how the grace machine is actually structured um, and also how room or the gap uh, the gap between habit or training or rehearsal and the actual construction of space, how that gap between them plays a role to actually find these figures of play, right? Because that's where they, they start to meet with each other. So this, this is a, a very serious form of play. Now, <clears throat> let's see if we can sort of... Uh, find a, a number of aspects um, in, 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 uh, in sports or play. Um, I think the first thing you see here is the lines. Um, it's very special because architects draw lines, you know, and then they uh, orthographically, generally orthographically, um, erect from those lines the walls. But here we get lines painted on on the field on 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 uh, i'm just thinking the word field um, champ in french uh, kampf that becomes kampf in, in german kampf actually means battle or match so the, the the notion of a of a battle or a match or a competition is immediately related to that that field being geometrically 
um, articulated, like the hopscotch. Like it's, these lines go into the field. Uh, they don't create space because you can, it's all open. You can just walk over those lines. You can jump over them. Um, but it is broken up. It is a space that is broken up. So it's not it's not smooth space. This field is not smooth, smooth space. It's actually highly articulated, highly articulated. That's why I put the image of the of the game board of chess. Um, I, I, I used the Bobby Fischer Michel Tal uh, game of 1970. It's not so important, but what is important is that you see a number of things. You see a, a field, in this case it's a board or a game board, and you see things, which are the pieces, the chess pieces. And if you look on the left, you, you see also lines on the field, and you see things, you see objects, you see the ball and the racket. And those are impossible to put together. Right, these, are, these can only be put together by moves or by figuration or by, yes, these, these very typical, um, um, very rule-based uh, uh, figurations. So we got two sides, we got two sides, we see two things. We see a world of, of things and objects that you can grab, right? So that's the space of the ape, that's the space of the monkey brachiating from the, hanging from the branch. And, and we see field, which was that space of, of the horse and rhythm. I mean, just think of, of the horse uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a source of, of rhythms. So just like if you increase the speed of a horse, you go from walking to trot, to canter, to gallop. I'm not sure if you know this, but uh, there's a four beat and then there's a two beat and there's a three beat and there's a four beat again in the gallop. So there's these, these, uh, and these are also very strict and not smooth or continuous at all. So it's not like you can just accelerate the horse that actually has to change rhythm and has to increase its jumps, right? Because with walking, it makes small steps and with gallop, it makes large jumps. So we get this this connection between the articulation of space, uh, which I can hardly call space because it's so abstract and smooth and flat, but it is divided up and broken and highly articulated. So in that sense, the horse and, and poetic feet uh, and rhythm are, are intricately connected. Now, the other thing about the board that is very important to understand is that it's oversized. Um, I mean, that's the most logical thing, of course, of 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 a game uh, that there's uh, two sets of of pieces, and then there's a whole field to actually act on it. So it must be the field must be larger than what the the pieces occupy. But that's for an architect. That's actually very strange, you know. For architect, things fit. Uh, um, this is all about, you know, how do we organize? How do we actually transform space into something that allows us to create room? I think that'd be the, the, the right way of formulating it. How do we actually devise space or leave space behind in a way that it, that it becomes capable of, of producing room? And room really means opportunity. Right, strategic moves. So you're moving in one direction, you leave a gap, so the other player, your adversary can actually act onto that space. But that space is, is, is not like as a, a space in court, Cartesian coordinates, nor in, in an Einsteinian notion of time space. It's something much more fractured. It's right, space itself breaks up and becomes a window. Um, and that's where room is. So there's a constant maneuvering in that, in that, in that machine of being oversized, in that machine of being oversized that actually allows for these uh, for these moves, right? <clears throat> so it's not fitting. It's not fitting at all, right? The pieces don't fit. They have their own moves. You know, the knight, the bishop, the queen, you know, the the pawn. They all have their own moves. It's, a, it's very choreographed, um, 
but it's all it's all about uh, finding room uh, uh, in that structure. So I think it would be correct to say, okay, there's a way of of transforming space into a machine that actually creates room, right? So space has to divide it up, broken up in such a way that these that it that its brokenness starts to play a role in the rhythm of how 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 the hand places the uh, the elements or the pieces uh, on on that field, right? So it's not that the pieces are the figures, though they're very they're almost like characters, and characters are very close to the notion of figure. But it's the moves that are that are the actual uh, uh, figures of grace, right? So we have to understand that. <clears throat> so it's open and not closed. It's rules and not laws. Um, and it's also it's not it doesn't happen so much in space as it happens in in room. So we got figures and room, and we got sculpture in space as a sort of transition. <clears throat> So we got we got a, a, a new sense. We we got something that is okay. We said there's a gap between habit and the figure, you know, right? Between gap, between habit and grace, but there's also a gap between the pieces and the board, right? By by structuring space in such a way that it doesn't become smooth anymore, but actually broken up. So there's like a space itself being broken is constructed in such a way that it allows for that habit also to break away and become a figure, right? So regarding, we're, we're having like gaps from, from different directions. Um, I, I put the goalkeeper here um, because it's it's very clear that, that um, um, yes, there is a, a, there is a jump, but this jump is a, is a Sure, it comes from habit and training and rehearsal and all those words um, and even automatism. But on the other hand, it it is uncertain, right? It's it's an expression of that uncertainty, and uh, that's that is is uh, well, that's 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 quite um, uh, almost like the core figure in that sense of the whole argument. Um, because it says, look, there is this this repetition of actions which which happened on the training ground, on the training fields, and then you bring that in in your memory, and then it breaks away, almost it breaks away from the flesh, and uh, becomes something unrepeatable because that figure cannot not be repeated. So the, the idea of the moment is very important as well. It is. Uh, um, it is as, as if time as a flow is not really capable of creating a moment. It's really a breaking a wave. So the, we almost get like a, 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 a double formulation. One is time, a side of time that, that breaks into a moment. Uh, I'm sure you know the difference between chronos and kairos and of time as, as, as sequential and, and kairos is something that is a, a window in time as an opportunity. And the other side is that space being uh, offering gaps, uh, breaking away from space and, be, and becoming room. So there's like two sides are, are coming together or starting to overlap, um, which is a, quite important for the understanding of, uh, of, uh, of what the grace machine uh, uh, could be. Now, <clears throat> I didn't put this diagram in the Grace and Gravity book, but uh, I think it, uh, for the lecture it's much more important also because, uh, you know, this, the Grace and Gravity book doesn't have any images and, uh, and this is full of images. So this, in that sense, it's, a, it's quite right to put in diagrams. Now, there's, um, I'm going to like separate the two. Uh, you see that figure in the middle. Uh, you, you can also see that difference between the field and the object, and I call that foot space. Uh, foot space is uh, that is uh, what is what is punctuated, uh, that is tessellated, uh, that is open to rhythms uh, and articulated. Um, but it is a field, and the other is that of of the hand 
and, and its objects. So we got this classic opposition between field and object, but it's it is an opposition also of foot space and hand space. Now I think it's important to say that. Um, these are actually not spaces. They're more like the poles of the of the machinery, or it's, they're actually the poles of space, how it breaks open. So in between, we get this gap. Now, it's the first gap we discussed, but it's actually called uh, gap number two on the right. It's not so important, but the figure somehow uh, occurs between these two. It, 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 it is a contoured entity, but it's in itself, it's rhythmic. Right, so that's why it's undulating a bit, um, and it's also a bit blurred in the sense of forgetza maybe, uh, where you get this sort of smear of movement um, that becomes a shining. But it, it, there is this, 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 the figure actually sort of almost like an erect uh, electrical uh, uh, spark uh, sort of occurs between these two poles, right? one, one at the at the bottom and one at the top. What's also important is that we get this vertical axis, right? Which is that vertical axis of, of, of stance. So the figure actually places itself on that axis of existence, right? So it it, it does want to be a, a, a real figure. Now, it actually comes from the other side, right? So we got, we got a, like an, an we, we just made a spatial argument, and now we make a temporal argument in the sense of yes, that is habit, and it and it drives us like a, like a flywheel, and there's a rhythms that 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 are created by that uh, that that flywheel. But then there's this breaking away, almost like there's a a, a takeoff of the jump that says okay, this rhythm actually starts to like produce a figure, which is, this is really the internal perspective of the gap. So there's an external perspective that we just saw, and there's an internal perspective, and these two have to come together. So we've got a habit side. I think this would be the diagram of the Grace machine. It's a very obscure diagram. It's drawn as as if as if it's, as if it's drawn by the by an architect. Uh, I'm on myself. I'm an ex architect, so on this, but I still have the sort of skills to actually draw such a thing. But it's it's a it's a very strange thing. It's a we have this. Uh, a rhythm coming in and then it breaks and it has two points. It has a takeoff and a landing and then in the apex, there's the figure. And of, of course, we know that uh, strange opposition between um, um, the start and end and, and that figure trying to contract between these two points. Um, these two points, um, start and end, uh, we're going to discuss Auerbach um, in this beautiful book, uh, Mimesis. Um, but he uh, he describes a history as a history of Mimesis, as a hist and that's why in historiography, in the writing of history, we get so much metaphor. And uh, in 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 his book, he um, he 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 makes uh, an opposition, creates an opposition at the beginning between. Uh, Greek mythology, the writing of Greek mythology and Christianity. And uh, what, what is very particular about Christianity and, and Christian, especially the patristic authors, the very early Christian authors, they always see similes. Um, one figure uh, is mirrored in another figure and one figure in time becomes another figure in time in the future, but like the second coming of Christ, for instance. So there's, there's like certain martyrs being like reflected from one side to, and of course that's that's the notion of metaphor. Metaphor but means to carry over. Uh, so one thing is being carried over to another thing. So is a metaphor two things or is it one figure? So that's what we get here is like, is that figure contracting these two, these two things, or is it actually splitting into two? So the notion of a figure is that it's one thing, but it's actually doing two things, right? So there's a, there's a jumping and a landing, and it's quite clear that this landing is heavily influenced by uh, by gravity. And uh, I I think in that sense that the story of grace is also. Um, 
one that is um, sort of spans between tragedy and comedy. Of course, if, if the jump fails, you get comedy, you get stumbling. Um, it's a beautiful description by Bergson uh, in his in his book on laughter, and we will be discussing this in the in the figure of falling, uh, somebody stumbling, and uh, and the whole street. I mean, so he's running over the, uh, along the street, and uh, and he uh, he stumbles and falls, and everybody is laughing, and uh, Bergson is describing why everybody is laughing. And uh, in that sense, it's it is a, uh, that that jump actually failing. That's comedy. And and then there's also another jump type um, where there's tragedy, where there's a, these actions are gathering so much weight that the hero, especially the hero, obviously, is being crushed. Right. So any Siegfried has so many events revolving. Uh, around himself that he's crushed by the events it makes me think of michael jackson um uh, he almost like completely instrumental in 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 the creation of his uh, of his death um <clears throat> which is typical for for tragedy and of course that's the role of the chorus uh, uh, so some of you are members of the chorus but that's so it's the chorus is always informing us in the during the tragedy of uh, of uh, yes, you will die, and, uh, and and so even in all his innocence, uh, the figure of the hero is 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 has to has to pay uh, for this by his death, right? So there's there's a uh, many things, and I'm also thinking about. Uh, let me see. Let me see if I can go back a few steps just for a second. So we get this diagram that we used. Move from the object and and that axis of of grace and beauty, and I'm thinking like, that, is that not movement on the floor, and then the object in the air? So is that that diagram that we showed earlier, of that transition? Is that also not part of of this diagram, right? Is that that um, that spanning of the figure between a sort of movement side and an object side? Is that also not like what we can superimpose here? <clears throat> that's something I thought of this morning. So I haven't really worked it out, but it's it's sure that's, that that and it, it it must like fit in there. So this is this is the diagram of it. It's uh, it's quite something. Um, the figure. Um, uh, I've drawn it almost like it breaks away. There's a piece of rhythm hanging in the air and blurring away. So that it, it, it must be that it's not by accident that it's uh, undulating. Uh, and and, and uh, the undulating figure, I just have to refer to this. It, it's, it's more extensively discussed in the, in this, in the, in the lectures on standing. But there, there is a whole history, especially in art, of the serpentine figure. I just have to mention this. Um, we did mention Leonardo already um, with his uh, Serpeggiare, uh, referred to by Ravison as, as a line of flux. Uh, Pierre Hadot, of course, uh, relates to it. Um, Bergson again. Um, and I'm not sure if that's the same figure as uh, what we see in mannerism, um, the figura serpentinata. So there's a serpentine figure. And uh, again, in Hogarth here in the in the 1750s, uh, you see, actually see the head of the snake. Um, what I think is missing, uh, or what's actually separated in two, is that we see the snake and we see a pyramid standing. So, and of course, in architecture, the pyramid is the, is the epitome of uh, of gravity, right? It's the pile. If you put like all, you just like uh, have sand and then you're uh, falling down, you would just create a, the perfect pile. And the pyramid is derived from that. So that there is a, a, a gravitational box with a, with a, a, a with a fluctuating figure in there. So uh, I, I think Leonardo gets a step further. He actually says graze in the limbs is, a, is a, the counterpoise and the equipoise actually creates stance, right? It's not it's not a figure of flow. That's what Pierre Hadot says. I think he's wrong there. It's a, it might be a line of flux, but that doesn't explain the posture of standing. So uh, 
we have to move forward here and, and actually see how the two figures of the pyramid and the, and the serpent can actually be, be, be put together. And I think that's, that's uh, um, especially important. And uh, I'm, I'm going to use two texts or two figures um, that will help us think that through. And, and, and they both sort of switch uh, to another side. One works from the notion of the schema and the other from the notion of the rhythm. Um, and what's really interesting about, uh, um, uh, I'm having it here in English, I love his discourse, um, and it's really at the beginning of the book that uh, Roland Barthes says, uh, yes, we're going to discuss figures as fragments, um, but they're not pure schema. I have to pronounce it again in in, in Greece in Greek, um, but because the schema is not the schema, it's not it's not that um, uh, plastic form, right? I have to refer here also to Auerbach's famous uh, text on the on the figure, the figura from 1938. I think there's this already the first sentence. The figure is plastic. Normally, the the figure usually the figure is defined as plastic form. Right, so it's it's a very external notion of form, an exteriority of form. So the schema, which he says, is actually the the old definition of uh, of the of the figure schema. So it's an external form. And then rhythm is of course an internal form. But what's so interesting about uh, the, these two authors is that Roland Barthes says yes, but it's 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 much better to actually understand it as as a set of actions or as an attitude or as a, as a set of gestures in the sense that uh, we have to look at athletes um, and statues and orators. So it's not just like a, 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 the figure is not, a, not just, a, I mean, it's quite radical what Roland Barthes is doing here because it's like he's displacing it from rhetoric. He's taking it away from, from rhetoric and he's putting it in another field of of sports and, uh, and and sculpture so the figure now is not a schema but but something that is actually is acting now on the other side we have Eugen Peterson um, this is a text from 1917 and it's never been translated and it's and it's it's really interesting and uh, uh, Jerome Pollard uh, refers to it pretty often and what's interesting is that um, Eugen Peterson has a has a, an alternative uh, explanation or interpretation of the word rhythmos, um, the, the Greek term rhythmos, as something that is not rhythm in the sense of flow. He says yes, the word flow in Greek is reo, um, but it's it's much better understood as a as it's as an etymology of the word reim, which means uh, trait. In German, that's Zug. Uh, now, Zug is, is a beautiful term in German because it, it means train, right? The Zug, like the train in the station. But a train is also a trait and a track and a trace. So a form of drawing. It's, it's, it's a trace of a, of a drawing. And uh, um, how do you actually formulate it? Wirklich von unseren Augen erhält so das Wort Rhythmus. It's, this is at the bottom. Gerade wie unseren Zug die Bedeutung einer unbewegten Gestalt, die durch Bewegung entstand. That means it's an unmoving form, which has been created by movement. An, an unmoving, a still form created by movement. Um, this is a, a beautiful definition because now we got rhythm moving in the direction of schema and on the left we get the word schema moving in the in the direction of rhythm so we get these both author authors sort of uh, transgressing um, the usual traditional interpretation of, of of terminology and actually sort of meeting halfway to create this idea of the figure so that, i think that's how we have to position the figure not as a pure rhythm and not as a pure schema not as a pure schema, not as a pure form, and not as a pure movement. So that's that's how we have to sort of overlap these these two ideas. Now that we found in uh, in in Burke and, and just in this sort of uh, 
this strange sentence, gracefulness is an idea belonging to posture and motion. And then later it related to je ne sais quoi, uh, un certain non so que, that we found in, in Ferenzola. So that, uh, that's the whole idea of, of the contrapposto. Yes, it is motion because all the limbs are moving. The heel is lifted, the heel is jumping. Uh, I even describe it uh, when, when I put the horse and the, and the ape next to each other in the lecture of standing, that it's actually hanging in itself. It's hanging in itself. It's partially hanging and it's partially standing. And of course, these are these can only be solved solved by a movement of limbs. Um, so it's it's not just like uh, oh, this is a, a relax. This is an easy uh, stance or something. This is actually a, a, it's a very complicated uh, uh, what we call a chiastic structure. It's uh, c uh, quite well known that the word uh, um, chiasmos chiasmos in 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 in, in Greek is not derived from uh, rhetoric, but it's actually derived from Polycleitos writing on, on sculpture. The text is lost, the, word, uh, the text was uh, is referred to as the canon. Uh, the, the first references come from the first century by Galen, for instance, Galen, the, the, the medical author, um, who describes uh, Polycleitos as the, as the sculpt as the first sculptor who used uh, uh, a system of proportions that were in symmetry. Uh, now the word symmetry at that time symmetria didn't mean what we understand as symmetry. That means uh, the same on both sides of the mirror axis. It actually means an interrelatedness of of the limbs. So if you would use the, if you would for instance bend the, the left knee. You know the, the 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 right shoulder would come down. So there's an interrelatedness and a networking and harmony of of movable members. Um, the word member is also used by Vitruvius. So it, it, these are not just parts. These are not just parts within a whole. But it's it is really uh, a, an activity, a set of activities that creates passivity. That creates stance. So it's it's a set of movements that actually creates stance. So it's often described as oh they, they what he wanted to make a sculpture more dynamic, but that's just a far too simplistic way of understanding what what happens in the contrapposto of the Doriforos, the spear the spear bearer, right? So this this figure this this uh, this bundle of 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 S shaped figures which I describe as a figure eight at a certain point. Is actually a, 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 di a, a yes, it is a movement, but like like in the word motion of Burke, but it creates posture. So this is the way of understanding uh, that that formula of posture and motion. It's not just end in the in the sense of a conjunction, but it's a true end in the sense of a, of a plus um, um, a plus sign that it's uh, the two start to like over over overlap with each other. Now the sign of that, I mean, the word chiastic actually means a chi-like. Uh, I already discussed that the, the word chi is is actually English for he. Uh, this is the, this is the the letter he, um, which is not X-shaped. Um, I think it, it, it it's it's uh, it would be good to just refer to that again, um, because symmetry is is a form of asymmetry here, or asymmetry is produced by symmetry. So you see the S, but you also see the other line, and together they create a, a, a ghosted line that we don't see, which is that vertical axis that we see here or over here. <clears throat> so chiastic, um, let's just try to say this more precisely. The human body obviously is symmetrical, but it's symmetrical as an organization. Now for architects, the symmetry of an organization immediately means the symmetry of form. So if you have a symmetrical organization of a building, you would see a symmetrical form. Sculpture, especially uh, uh, contrapposto, is much more intelligent. It actually says, you, yes, there is a symmetry of organization, but there's an asymmetry of form. 
right? So we can only understand the asymmetry as, as being produced by the symmetry. So the symmetry and asymmetry do not like occur on the same level, right? There's, a, there's a one is an organizational structure that actually produces the asymmetry on the other level. Yes, the figure being one thing and doing two things, I think that's that's clearly in here. It's also saying that, yes, the metaphor is a, is a jump, it's a carrying over. I mean, this word carrying is really interesting and uh, because um, in behavior and attitude, we carry ourselves. It's a, what, what we call a comportment. Um, and so again, we get this idea of, of, of a movement over time being contracted in a, in a single figure. Um, I think that in, in that sense, the chiasmos or the chiasmus is, um, and we know that from rhetoric, you know, the famous example of, uh, of Shakespeare, uh, fair is foul and foul is fair, um, is a, a chiastic structure. Um, but it's not, doesn't mean it's, that it's neutral. The way fair is foul is not the same way as, as foul is fair. And, um, and, and that's with all chiastic structures. There's always like a, a, an asymmetry in the formulation. Now, an asymmetry that we know some well from mate, metaphor, but a metaphor, it's, it's impossible to, to turn, right? To make a, 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 a double figure of speech. Right, so in that sense, the, the chiastic structure is always a, a, a looping figure and not just a jumping figure. So in, in that sense, it's a bit of a correction on my, my diagram. Now let's, let's move back to uh, machines, because um, I, um, I promised to uh, relate the, the grace machine to, to technology. Um, so we're, we're looking at, at a driving a car and we're looking at self-driving a self-driving car. Um, it, I think it's important to, to compare the two. Uh, the, the, the driving, we already said, is a, is a chiastic structure. It's like you're driving the car and the car is driving you, though not in the same way. One is prosthetic and the other is mimetic. Um, and that's a chiastic structure, but there's also um, a, a, a notion of, uh, of passivity in that action. Right, so again, over time and, and becoming a single figure in time, uh, as in a moment. And of course, the self-driving car uh, is a pure expression of that passivity because you're sitting there as a package or as a passenger while the car is driving. Now, on the left, I would also say, it, yes, the car is driving, but it's driving through you and then transforming you into driving. Right, so that's again that loop that I discussed with uh, with uh, Gregory Bateson, but it's actually not a symmetrical loop. It's not a symmetrical loop. While on the right, that is a self-enclosed loop, and you're basically not there. So you're you're like, and of course that's a sort of the horror of of technology, this understanding of of uh, of comfort uh, or ergonomics that uh, that. Is is so perfect in in its understanding, or or its replacing of human action, its replacing of human action, that it starts to self loop, it starts to self loop, and uh, and 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 makes you uh, almost the prosthesis of the machine. You know, this is like a almost a reversal of of that understanding of a, of the prosthetic. Now there's a, there's a whole discussion about this. Um, I'm I'm uh, I'm, what, I'm looking uh, at uh, the third stanza of a, of a poem by uh, by Richard Brautigan from 1970-67, I think. I like to think it has to be of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labors, leisure, and joined back to nature return to our mammal brothers and sisters and all watched over by machines of love and grace. So I had to just put that in, obviously. Um, now the word ecology and cybernetic uh, refer to Gregory Bates and obviously uh, in ecology, the ecology of loops, of feedback, 
of, uh, of food cycles. Um, um, but cybernetics is a is an understanding of processes that that yes they steer, but they steer um, through correction, uh, through uh, feedback, uh, which is uh, basically a, a loop between the inside out and the outside in. So you're like acting. You're making things happen, but things also happen to you, right? There's a, there, there's this action and passivity that are like uh, 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 being alternated in in the idea of cybernetics, which is not at all not at all uh, uh, being watched over by machines of love and grace, which is a sort of uh, uh, Catholic technology, I guess. And uh, this is understanding of grace as something that's fully transcendent and, and then says, OK, now we have machines displacing or replacing that notion of transcendence and now we're being watched over. So it, it happens from above. Um, now, um, I'm, I'm going to like compare that. To, um, these are just like uh, the last four or five slides. Um, I'm now an hour, so it will just be another 15 minutes. To uh, to uh, well, uh, one of the weirdest stories by uh, James uh, Graham Ballard. Uh, it's it's from the a, a, a bundle of uh, of short stories titled um, Vermilion Sands, and this one, The Thousand Dreams of Stella Vista. I've been reading this for ages um, uh, as a student. We translated it and. Uh, um, we published it in in, uh, in uh, one of our magazines in, in Dutch at that time, uh, The Thousand Dreams of Stella Vista. I'm not sure if you ever read this. It's a beautiful story. It's only like 10, 15 pages. And uh, it's about a couple. It's about a, a man and wife um, in some kind of suburb in California. And they're going to buy a, a PT house. PT stands for psychotropic house. So they're buying a, a psychotropic house. Now, what's a psychotropic house? It's a it's a house uh, full of what he calls senso cells, um, which is a way of uh, of the house adapting to its uh, inhabitant. And uh, by adapting uh, to its behavior, it also adapts to its character. Here we go again. So the the behavior, the comportment becomes that that character, that figure. And that figure in this case is Gloria Tremaine. So the, 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 the person living in the house before they entered it is Gloria Tremaine, is a celebrity, I think it's a famous actress, who committed suicide after, uh, after a, a bout of madness and after she killed her husband, who I think was an architect. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, so Gloria is embedded in the in the sensor system of the house, and Howard and his wife uh, enter the house, and everything goes well. And but slowly, uh, the house is responding far better to Howard than to his wife. And uh, you might say the house is slowly falling in love with with the inhabitant, and the inhabitant slowly falls in love with Gloria. The wife becomes very jealous and, and leaves the house and they get divorced. And Howard is living there with, with Gloria. And, uh, that, and that's, the, that's the actual, um, on the right, that's the actual uh, illustration of Gloria. It's a very weird illustration it's from the 1963. Um, now, Gloria is not very stable. So sometimes uh, the rooms are aggressively changing form or the corridors are closing. There's some kind of latex, some kind of psychological latex on the walls that uh, allows the house to deform. It's quite beautiful. And uh, things are like transforming so much that uh, it's actually uh, uh, described by Ballard as a grand mal, as an epileptic uh, uh, attack. So we get a series of epileptic attacks, and you see in the illustration that Howard is now running from the house, uh, 
and uh, scared and, uh, and and then later he puts up the machine and, and Gloria is declared dead. I'm I'm putting that I'm putting that image of uh, extreme home automation uh, against uh, Alexa on the left um, because Alexa is interested in only one thing that's uh, that's uh, comfort. And uh, so that means to make it as easy as possible for us to live. But while Alexa is doing that, she is like uh, doing our, uh, taking over our, our actions. She is, she's like uh, ordering your books. She's ordering the groceries. She's like talking to the fridge. Um, she's like talking to the children which I've, I've read last week actually can go terribly wrong when Alexa proposes to put a coin uh, to like, for, it was with playing children, I think, the children were playing and they were asking Alexa what to do now because they were bored. And Alexa told them, well, why don't you put a, a, a coin next to a, a power plug so you can connect the two ends. And, and the mother had to run over who was listening to Alexa's advice and the mother was running over to actually prevent the children from doing this. So that's a, uh, that's a, a notion of, of technology being a, almost like a perfect mold taking over uh, um, our lives and basically making you so passive, right, that you uh, uh, almost like you're in, t in intensive care. So um, I put a red cross through Alexa and I'm thinking like, what would it mean to, to think through a, a Gloria a bit better? Um, these Alexa and Gloria, I'm not, uh, I'm not clear, I'm not sure why they're women. Uh, they, you could also compare them to Olympia in, uh, in um, Walter Benjamin's uh, uh, idea of uh, Art Nouveau. So we get another female figure. Um, I'm discussing that in the in, in, in the lecture on standing when I when we get to Art Nouveau, and I think that's in the second part. <clears throat> now I just want to show you shortly. I, I wouldn't normally do this, but um, um, I, we've done this with students. And actually thinking of what would it mean to uh, uh, to uh, roboticize, if that's a term, to automate uh, uh, human life and um, and we brought in all kinds of ideas of uh, of the gap and uh, and uh, this, this problem of uh, of how do you how do you take a position between Alexa and uh, Gloria because you don't want to be chased out of the house and you don't want to be comforted to death, right? So what students did is actually um, um, something that's really interesting is they. They uh, liberated the house from uh, from their what we call poche. Now, poche is a very interesting term in architecture. Um, I'm not sure everybody knows what it is, but if you if you fit a number of rooms together that are in different shapes, of course we don't we are not used to that in modernism. We have like one rectangular room next to another rectangular room, and they make the thinnest possible wall which is still hollow, but it's very thin. But if you would have a round one next to a, a straight one, you, you get a large pocket. And uh, that pocket, arch architects draw this pocket as something that's solid, as if it is made out of, uh, out of solid uh, material, stone, and they hatch it, they ha or they color it like, uh, for instance, in pink. You can, in neoclassical drawings, you see this beautiful pink in the walls. But if you actually make a section, you'll see it's, it's empty. And it's so empty that servants can actually use it to go from one room to another. So you can find like a, a, a door in the, the bedroom of uh, Marie Antoinette, a door actually sort of hidden in the wallpaper. So walls are actually hollow. Uh, and that's that's interesting because we get a, a second nation, a second uh, concept of of space here. We get the spaces within the rooms, and then we get the room between the rooms. So what did students do? They actually draw the walls of very ancient buildings, which are very heavy walls, as uh, as very thin with space in between them. And that space in between them actually allows them 
to move the the rooms a bit almost like their their vehicles and they would actually delete rooms or take them apart so what you see on the left is day 16 in, in a, a, a huge structure that is uh, inhabited by uh, by by like at, at least 40 people so it's like in that sense it's like a commune uh, where uh, through an interactive system um, the walls are being broken and the rooms are being broken and opening up. So it's a notion of poche that actually makes the whole plan a game board. That would be the right way of saying it. So you, you're actually throwing away, you're deleting rooms, and that means you're cre uh, increasing the, the, the amount of poche. And you get, at a certain point, you get this, this notion of a game board because now you get open spaces and, uh, and closed spaces, and that means you can actually move them about. Now, of course, these are futurist, uh, or in that sense, sort of science, science fiction projects. But all these elements are moving on, on air bearings. I'm not sure if you know what those are, but they, you can actually move enormous weights, as, uh, like in um, airplane factories or like structural companies. You can move enormous tons of tons of elements uh, very lightly on a plateau that is lifted by, by an air caster. And uh, it actually makes no sound at all. And they use it in the theater too, to change between acts. So you can actually roboticize, and uh, um, you can see here how the house, or the, yeah, I think it's a house, uh, a phalanstery, maybe in the terms of uh, Fourier. It's actually transforming, you see, from day 16 to day 997, to completely change. And you see the, the furniture responding to the changes. And of course, the whole question is, is how intelligent is the machine? And, and how intelligent are the people to actually adapt their patterns. But you see it's a gap machine. It's actually a gap machine in the sense that it's, 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 it's creating opportunities in, in space uh, to actually change your life. I think that's almost a, a slow to die term. Uh, there's another one I'd just like to show you on the, on the, on the bottom left. Uh, they, they actually took, uh, took a, an English Palladian villa, the, the, the famous uh, uh, Chiswick house by Lord Burlington, and they removed all the poche, or they actually made the poche into air. And uh, you see all the rooms, and I think you see already a few transformations. And then there is a second space next to it. And they defined that as a yard. And that's a beautiful idea. Yard is connected to the idea of a garden. Yard and, and garden have the same uh, etymology. And th this robot in the attic, I think I have to explain is like, uh, because in architecture, poche is very important. Um, let me let me just like sh shortly explain this. Um, uh, there's an architect in the 1950s, uh, Louis Kahn, who separated served from servant spaces. Now, that's not an accident at all because servant spaces existed much longer uh, in, in the form of poche. And of course, these are, these are spaces used by, well, first by work in the sense of support and structure and plumbing, but also by servants. Servants would actually at that time uh, walk in the, in the poche spaces. So we got served and servant, and at a certain point, that servant space becomes larger and larger. It becomes air conditioning. It becomes uh, uh, sewage. It becomes like there's this whole technology, this sort of uh, of secondary spaces, which of course, if you go to like Downton Abbey, you know, go back to Downton Abbey, where is the house is almost divided in two, where you get upstairs and downstairs, and you get this army of servants like uh, providing service. And, uh, uh, and here that, that secondary space is uh, that poche is actually broken up in, in a set of steps. See, now the yard is being filled by, by pieces of Chiswick. And um, from an architectural point of view, this is really interesting because uh, uh, the Chiswick house is a classical structure. So that means you have elements that are very, very clearly defined, like dome and frieze and column and, and capital and pedestal. And all those elements are extremely clearly defined. 
but there's another side to classicism that says no it all comes to us as fragments if you if you look at like Piranesi or or John Soane, you'll see there's an obsession from classical architects with 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 pieces of uh, of architecture as uh, of course ruins, but in this sense uh, as as fragments. And uh, you see here that it's being fragmented and 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 reassembled, not according to classical rules, obviously. And uh, you see that this this there's now a mixture of this first space and this 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 second space <clears throat> in architecture the poche is always uh, uh, a space of fantasy and imagination it's the uh, it's the attic uh, where we play it's the cupboard i see as lewis you know narnia you you go into narnia via the cupboard uh, you play under the bed so there's there's all these sort of rooms or secondary spaces uh, in architecture that are sort of haunting, especially in the in the case of uh, domestic architecture, that are haunting the house, and um, are 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 putting like a, a a claim on that that first space. So in this case, they're like um, um, this this whole space of invention of changing her life in Sloterdijk's term is now uh, becomes a playing field. Uh, where you, well, I wouldn't say constantly have to reimagine your life, but there's a slowness. I think in this project, it, it changes over for like 40 years span. Um, but I just wanted to show you like these ideas of, uh, of, of the gap and the jump and play do actually have a, a few roots in architecture. It doesn't mean that you can actually design uh, Machines of love and grace, um, but you can sort of create uh, opportunities, which I think is uh, is uh, is interesting to show. I don't want to make the the same mistake as uh, as in any conferences where you have a lecture and then it ends with uh, how you do this in architecture. But I thought that it would be a, like an exp interesting experiment. So I think I want to stop here.